الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته Welcome brothers and sisters to our weekly program analyzing the address where we revisit the contents of the khutbah talk about its contents in a little bit more detail and try to provide additional context and information that we were unable to share during the specified time for the khutbah and the title of today's khutbah was holding fast to religion in times of uncertainty uncertainty in quotes and that was not um, by accident at any rate uh, I want to start by saying that um, I'm a little worried because I don't want every khutbah or a number of the khutbahs to appear gloomy or to paint a grim picture and I feel like perhaps uh, the khutbah today and some of the recent khutbahs where we talked about the disease of the heart um, may be doing that and I definitely don't want to do that we do want to have some of those sermons where we talk about um, lighter subjects and the topics seem to be in of themselves highly encouraging uh, but at the same time, there are certain things that are going on uh, in the world around us that we need to raise awareness of. We need to call people's attention to, and I feel that I would be remiss and it would be a dereliction of duty if I saw the impending danger and didn't warn against it. And that's, and that's why some of the um, khutub, they may have that gloomy or grim air about them, but that's not intentional. That's not the intention, but at the same time, if there is something or some things that we need to be aware of, I have no choice but to call our attention to it. That said, um, one of the points that we mentioned in the opening was that in matters of faith, we must exercise an abundance of caution. We as Muslims have to be extra careful when it comes to our religion, our faith, our belief, guarding it, being on guard against things which will threaten it, which will cause us to question what we believe or totally abandon what we believe, we have to ex exercise an abundance of caution. And this is something which is supported by the Nusus, uh, by the texts, Quran and Hadith, a number of them. So for example, we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us in the Quran, وَخُذُوا hidrakum," And take your precautions. And there are a number of ayat which tell us in the Qur'an to be careful, to be cautious in general, and especially when it comes to our faith. And we also have the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the hadith of Nu'man ibn Bashir, in which the Prophet ﷺ, in the course of that hadith, he said, فَمَنِ اتَّقَ الشُّبُهَاتِ اِسْتَبْرَأَ لِدِينِهِ وَعِرْضِهِ وَمَنْ وَقَعَ فِي الشُّبُهَاتِ وَقَعَ فِي الْحَرَامِ he said, whoever avoids doubtful matters exercises caution. That person safeguards thereby both his religion and his reputation. While he who engages in doubtful matters ultimately engages in the prohibited. What's the message? The message is, O Muslim, when it comes to matters of faith, exercise a great deal of caution and abundance of caution. So then we went on and we said how this, abund this abundance of caution in matters of faith is particularly important for us in these times and in this environment. And that is because when we live in this time, and especially in this environment, we are surrounded with, we are confronted with an overabundance of contending views. Whether those views are within the Islamic community, we do have, unfortunately. We have a lot of differing and disputations and differences of opinion within the Muslim community. And so in order to find the truth, that requires that we exercise some caution, that we just don't take everything at face value, that we scrutinize every statement, every, every statement, and every opinion, etc. But beyond the Muslim community, here in the West, we are also exposed outside of our own communities to an overabundance of contending views, whether that be from other faith groups, the Jews, Christians, the Buddhists, the Hindus, etc., or it be from groups that deny the existence of God altogether and oppose any form of organized religion, 
or it could be from political philosophies, it could, could be from social movements, etc. There are just so many opinions about each and everything that we're confronted with. And so because of these times and because of this environment, we have to even exercise an additional amount of caution. In addition to what we said about an, an abundance of caution, we need to be even more cautious than that. And we mentioned the reasons why, in addition to that, is that one reason is because our religion is constantly under siege. Why? Because all these different opinions are coming at us. And number two, we mentioned that we rarely realize that the siege is taking place, which again means that we have to be vigilant. Because many times we're being attacked, our faith is under siege, and we don't even realize that that siege is taking place. And that's because the methods for the siege are very clandestine and the attacks are packaged and presented in a way that makes us feel that we are being helped rather than harmed. And we talked about that more and we'll talk about it more, we talked about it more later in the khutbah and we'll also revisit that later in our commentary uh, this evening. And we mentioned the ayah from just to emphasize and drive home the point that our religion is constantly under siege. We mentioned the ayah from Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 217 in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says وَلَا يَزَلُونِ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ حَتَّى يُرُدُّوكُمْ عَنْ دِينِكُمْ We say, he, uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and they will never cease, they will continue and never cease to fight you until they can turn you away from your religion if they're able to do so. Allah is telling us that this siege is constant, it is consistent, it is never ending. That we're always under attack and so therefore we need to be vigilant, we need to exercise overabundance of caution. And then we close the first khutbah with a quote from a contemporary commentator explaining and expanding on this verse and how it is not just confined to physical military, physical warfare, military campaigns with bullets and guns and missiles and tanks and planes and fighter jets and bombers. No, it goes beyond that to something which is more often used, and that is spiritual, intellectual warfare and campaigns against moral decency and good conduct. And that quote came from uh, a contemporary scholar by the name of Muhammad ibn Saleh al uh, Muhammad ibn Saleh al Uthaymin, who has a uh, collection of books of tafsir called Tafsir al Quran al Kareem. And that particular quote came from volume number three page 60 from that uh, collection. And I'll just mention or revisit some of the points that he made. He said that intellectual warfare and campaigns against good morals are more destructive than a war waged with weapons because the former affects the ummah in ways they've not realized, because you don't see it coming. And obviously, if you're fighting an enemy and that enemy is so stealth that you don't realize that he's coming to attack you until he has already done so, that's very dangerous. That's particularly uh, a particularly dangerous enemy if you don't see him coming until it's, all, until, it's, until it's too late. Then he went on to say, he said, it is a lethal weapon that ravages the Ummah without being perceived. That Because he talked about how the physical warfare is not as dangerous, not as lethal as the uh, intellectual warfare. And he described this intellectual warfare as something which ravages the Ummah. It just tears through the Ummah. It obliterates the Ummah. It sets the ummah far it sets the ummah back far more than any type of physical warfare that may be waged against the ummah then he said and he talked about how this intellectual warfare has corrupted the dunya and deen of many muslims and whoever reflects upon history will clearly see the reality of what the enemies of islam are trying to achieve and he talks about reflecting on history and i'm just going to mention briefly obviously there are many examples that we could uh, refer to but I want to mention briefly the colonial period and how um, the colonial powers colonized different Muslim uh, majority countries and regions. And if you look at those regions which now have, um, over time, they ultimately came to a period where they removed the yoke of the colonizers from around their necks and they were able to reclaim their countries and their independence politically and to self-determine, etc. But the damaging effects of the thought and morals of the colonizers that conquered those Muslims conquered their minds. 
was far more lasting than the physical damage caused by the military campaigns. If we look now, most, most if not all of those countries are free from their colonizers. They're independent and they have the right to determine their destiny politically. But when you look at their behavior, when you look at their character, when you look at their commitment to Islam, you can see the damage, the lasting damage that this intellectual warfare, the Western thought, the thought of the colonizers, the morals of the colonizers, colonizers had on those people, it still remains today. Even though their lands are no longer under the foot of the colonizers. So you see what you see the truth of what the Imam was saying when he said that this is a far more lethal type of warfare. This intellectual warfare is far more lethal than the uh, the physical military warfare. And then we went on and mentioned the second khutbah that more and more we are seeing what we believe and our way of life come under attack. And this is happening in a number of different ways, and it's, materi it, uh, it's a materializing in a number of different forms. So, for example, uh, one of the things that's coming under attack is the, traditional, is the traditional family. That's one of the things that's coming under attack, and there is just a constant uh, bombardment. There is a constant um, war being waged against the traditional family. Another one, the patriarchal family structure in Islam, where a man goes out and he's the breadwinner and he goes out to, uh, make, to make money and to support his family. And he is looked at as the head of the household and the leader of the family. This is under attack. Also, gender norms. Are there some things, some roles, some jobs, some duties, some responsibilities that are particularly, uh, they are particularly that men are particularly disposed to, and some that women are particularly, um, particularly disposed, predisposed to? Does that exist? Well, in Islam it does, but this thought process, this idea that there are some things that befit men and some things that befit women is something which is constantly under attack and something which is constantly railed against, uh, especially in Western societies. Also, the Islamic penal code, how Islam punishes criminals for certain crimes. Also the Islamic legal and political system in general, what they call a sharia, this is also constantly under attack. So these are just some examples of many of things that we are seeing that we believe and that we hold dear and they're part of our way of life which have come under attack in recent times. And we went on to say that these attacks are presented in a very attractive and appealing way using language that allows these attacks to appear harmless at worst favorable at best. And basically our enemies, one of the things that they have done very adroitly is that they have been able to attack us and make us think that they are doing us a favor. That their attacks are so subtle, they're so devious, that the attackers, our enemies, are so skilled at espionage and the art of deceit that they are able to make us believe that they are doing us a favor by attacking our religion and undermining our beliefs. And we talked about how they do this using certain language. There are certain terms that they commonly use to paint the attacks in a good light, to give them a, um, uh, to, to, make, to make us picture them as something good. We mentioned, for example, how they use the word modernity, they use the word enlightenment, they use the word reform, they use the word tolerance, religious freedom, certainty, and yaqeen, etc. And I want to say a few things about that passage uh, from the khutbah. One is that there are a number of scholars um, from the, I guess you'd say the, the Middle Ages, if you will, some of the very learned uh, scholars from that period, like Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Al-Qayyim and Al-Shatabiyyu and other scholars from the past, who they all have these recorded statements, these rec they, they've all gone on record as asserting that there is no falsehood that is promoted or adopted by a group that is purely false. But rather it is always falsehood mixed with some truth. That basically if you or anyone were to come to a group of people and you came with pure falsehood, those people would reject it. 
Most people with good common sense would reject falsehood, which is clearly false. So how do people get tricked into following falsehood? That falsehood is mixed with truth. Because pure falsehood fools no one or very few, but falsehood mixed with truth, painted with the paint of truth, given this varnish of truth, it will be believed by many. And Sufyan Athodi, he has a very good quote in which he says what means. He says, there is no misguidance except that it is adorned attractively. You know, ma min, ma min shubhatin illa wa alayha zina. He said, there's no doubt, there's no balal, there's no batil, except that it is adorned attractively. So do not expose your religion to the scheming of one who despises you for, and this is important too. Because a lot of times the people who are telling us that they're trying to help us are people who deep down, openly or uh, covertly, explicitly or implicitly, they hate our religion. They hate what we believe in. And that's the wrong person to trust, to take advice from about what you should believe and what you shouldn't believe what parts of your religion you should stick to, and what parts need to be reformed, etc. This is the mistake that we make. How can we trust people who hate us because of our religion? Hate our religion, how can we trust them to give us good advice about how to practice and how to believe and interpret our religion? Right? Especially when Allah says, وَلَن تَرْضَ عَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَن نَصَارَ حَتَّى تَتَّبِعُ مِلَّتَكُمْ I'm sorry, مِلَّتَهُمْ he says that these disbelievers will not be pleased with you until you follow their religion. Uh, another point that I want to make on that particular passage is that some of the words they use, for example, they use words like modernity, they use words like tolerance or religious freedom. Is Islam, is Islam opposed to modernity? If what you mean by modernity is the use of of technological use and the benefiting from technological advancements that are made that have nothing to do with religion. For example, um, technological advancements in terms of the way that we engineer and build structures. Taking advantage of that, the way that transportation has evolved, the way that um, lighting the way that technology can now be used as a means to promote Islam, like using these cell phones and using these um, social media platforms, etc. Uh, no, Islam is not opposed to that. The Prophet ﷺ, when he built his masjid, there was no light in his masjid. And one of the companions who came from another region, he offered the Prophet to build lamps and lanterns that could be lit to illuminate the masjid and the prophet accepted accepted that the prophet was open to modernity if what is meant by that is technological advancements that benefit us in our dunya but what the prophet was opposed to is these changes and alterations in the deen and we'll talk about that a little further shortly also is islam opposed to tolerance a lot of people, when they talk about tolerance and Islam being tolerant, they'll quote the ayah from Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 256, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا إكراه في الدين قد تبين الرشد من الغيب That there is no compulsion in religion, truth has become clear from falsehood. So they say, see, Islam is a very tolerant religion. Islam is a tolerant religion, although that ayah might not necessarily be being interpreted appropriately. But Islam is a very tolerant religion, uh, for, cert for sure. But what do we mean by tolerance? And this is the thing too, because some people use the word tolerance and use the verses and a hadith which indicate tolerance in a way which was not intended. And they apply it in a way which is actually a contradiction to what Islam teaches. And then does Islam oppose religious freedom? Does Islam oppose religious freedom? And again, we have to ask the question, what do you mean by religious freedom? And a lot of people will quote the verse from Surah Al-Kaf, verse number 29, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقُولَ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ That, and say the truth from your Lord, 
and whoever wills let him believe and whoever wills let him disbelieve that ayah does not mean that people are free to choose whatever religion they like and if they choose whatever religion there will be no consequ consequence if they choose the wrong religion there will be no consequence in the hereafter in fact Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is stating that not to give permission but rather warning he's stating it in a way of basically what they call a tadid warning people yeah you have the freedom to choose but you also have to understand that there are consequences connected to that choice finally we closed um, uh, we mentioned in the khutbah not finally but one of the things that we mentioned toward the end of the khutbah is how um, the Prophet ﷺ predicted that there would come a time المتمسكوا يوم إذن بدينه كالقابض الجمر that the one who hold fast, holds fast to his religion in that time will feel as if it will be as if he is holding on to a hot coal just wanted to expand on that a little bit basically and I said that I felt it sure seems like these are those times and the reason why I say that is because if you are a religious person trying to follow the religion as revealed to the Prophet Muhammad in our times, especially in our environment, you feel that everyone is against you, whether those be Muslims or non-Muslims. That you may, for example, when you're around non-Muslims and you look the part, so to speak. So, for example, a Muslim woman who wears um, proper hijab and is very conservative about how she dresses will um, face the ire of non-Muslims in many cases and even sometimes some Muslims she'll face the ire of those Muslims because of her conservative way of dressing a Muslim man who grows a full beard who wears you know a prayer cap who wears a loose fitting garment keeps that garment for example above his ankles or whatever which all of these are legislated matters or matters related to appearance if he does that he will receive the ire of non-muslims as well in some cases muslims he may have a difficult time getting employed by muslims and non-muslims and so to the point that i have met people who i know and who are very good people they are people of the masjid people who come and give the aban people who pray five times a day in the masjid people who when people talk to them they're very kind they're very giving they try to be helpful I met I am I met and personally know people like that who will tell me that I don't feel that anyone in the community likes me I don't have any friends no one will befriend me why won't they befriend a person like that a person who is honest and trustworthy a person who comes to the masjid five times a day gives the event the masjid leads the prayer if the imam is in present why wouldn't people want to be that person's friend it's a per, and a person like that who is a normal human being who just like any human being wants to have some type of social life wants to have friends wants to have people that he can go and have dinner with that he can just call and text people that he can go and hang out with people that he can you know have conversations conversations with people he can use as a sounding board and maybe say hey I, I've got some problems or I have two job offers and I'm trying to decide between the two of them everybody wants people like that in their life but why can't this person have friends or why would a person of this level of Islamic character why would that person have a struggle having friends and if he struggles having friends because of his Islam how hard is it for him to continue to hold on to it? and this is one example of the many examples which can explain what the Prophet meant when he said he'll, be, he'll feel like a person was what holding on to a hot coal he wants to actually what maybe stop doing some of these things that are good things things which, which, will, which, will, which, will, things which will draw him closer to Allah he may think about consider giving them up just so that what he can get he can have friends just so he can get that job just so that he can you know get married whatever it may be and so you can see how a person sticking to his religion under these circumstances it may be very difficult for them to remain steadfast because everything is pulling him towards what? Just give up your deen, so what? So you can live in your dunya. So you can have what other people have and enjoy what other people enjoy. Then in closing, we close with the hadith 
collected by Tirmidhiyu and Abu Dawood on the authority of al Ibn ibn Sariyah, in which the Prophet ﷺ, he was talking about what we should do. What's the remedy if we're dealing with these situations and we're living in these times where there's so much difference, in, difference of opinion and so many disputes and so many contending views and we're a little confused, quite frankly. And we mentioned how the Prophet said that we should hold on to his sunnah and bite onto it with our molded teeth. And what does that mean? What is the Prophet alluding to if he tells us to bite onto it with the back teeth? It means that there's going to be what, Salatif? There are going to be things that are going to come your way that are going to shake you and try to get you to abandon your Those things come, don't give up, don't compromise. Bite down harder on those principles. Hold faster to those principles. Because those principles are, going to, principles are going to get you through those difficult times. And also those principles are going to benefit you. And those teachings are going to benefit you in the hereafter. Also what the Prophet said, he said, Beware of newly invented matters in religion. It's important in religion. Now the Prophet ﷺ is not opposed or telling Muslims not to take benefit of what? Newly invented matters in the world. New technologies. New services. New ways of doing things in the world. But he doesn't want us to be open to newly, newly invented matters in deen. Why? Because the deen is complete, the deen is perfect. From the time that the Prophet Sallallahu mission was complete, it doesn't need any additions or deletions or interpolations or omissions. The deen is fine as it is. Just practice it as it is. That's what will lead you to success. And last but not least, the Prophet closed by saying, وَكُلُّ بِجْعَةٍ بَلَالَةٍ He said that every innovation, every heresy is misguidance. This kullu, it is something which indicates an umum. There's no exception to this rule, brothers and sisters. As Ibn Umar, he said, kullu bid'atin dalala wa in ra'ahan wa in ra'ahan nasu hasana. He said, every innovation is misguidance, even if some people consider it to be good. And this is important, brothers and sisters. This is a fundamental, princi fundamental principle that we can't forget in these times. Somebody comes to you and tells you something religious, tells you to believe something, tells you to accept something as moral. You immediately, you look to see, is there any support for this in the Sunnah of the Prophet the teachings of Islam, Quran and Sunnah. Did the early Muslims understand it this way, practice it, accept that, believe that? If they didn't, you reject it on its face. I don't care who brings it to you. Why? Because what the Prophet is teaching us is a qaida which the early Muslims used to teach their pupils. Never speak about a religious issue. Never adopt a religious opinion. And you don't have a precedent for it. You don't have someone from the early Muslims, particularly that golden age of Islam, the period of the companions, and those who follow them and those who follow them, that that gold sandals, first three generations, you don't have anyone from them who said what's being said, who believed what you're being asked to be what you're, what you're being asked to believe, and who accepted what you're being asked to accept in religious matters. Mind this, pay attention to this, brothers and sisters, and I mention this because we are living in a time where there are people within the Muslim community and outside of it who are trying to get us to change, to accept a religion different from the religion of our predecessors. And a, a, a religion which doesn't resemble their religion except in name only. And if we fall for that, if we fall for that because of certain personalities, certain people that we like, we won't be able to blame them on the Day of Judgment and we won't, they won't take responsibility. But rather, we will, both, we will all share in the consequences of that choice that we make. And this is important, brothers and sisters. These personalities and these people that we look up to and we like and we want to follow them, these people who may be misguiding us unwittingly, unbeknownst to us, those people... They may have an excuse. What excuse do we have? What excuse do we have when the Prophet is telling us 
فَإِنَّ كُلَّ بِدَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ Beware of newly invented matters in religion. Every heresy, every innovation in religion is misguidance. So make that your love the truth more than you love the people. Stick to the principles, ignore the personalities, and inshallah ta'ala, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all successful on the day that we meet him. Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka nabi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.